So we will proceed now to our panel on progress in preserving open space. But, so the first speaker is Jeremy Madsen of Greenbelt Alliance. Jeremy. Oh, thank you, Linda. The trailer was actually a great lead in to, uh, to my remarks. I've been asked to uh, talk a little bit about the history of Bay Area's efforts to protect open space, some of our successes and some of the challenges I see going forward. And let, let's go to the next slide. So this really is what inspires the work of Greenbelt Alliance and I think what inspires uh, many of us in the room. Uh, it's images like this. We live in an absolutely amazing place, one of the greatest places on earth. Um, wonderful cities and towns set in a, a, a stunning natural landscape. And, and we really have it all. So let, let's go to the next slide. So we have, this isn't about open space, but we have uh, wonderfully diverse uh, cities, towns, neighborhoods, next slide. We are a hub of innovation and the 21st century global economy. Obviously some challenges with that right now around affordability and uh, economic equality, but in a lot of ways I think those are challenges we'd love to solve here in the Bay Area versus facing the same challenges like we have in, in say, places like Detroit. Let's go to the next slide. And of course, we have this absolutely amazing landscape of Northern California, a little bit of what we just heard about in the movie trailer. We have everything from the Redwood Forest to the coast to places to get out inside and play, to wine country, to, uh, you know, to some of the most bountiful farms in the entire world. And just flip through the next couple of slides here, showing some of those images. One more, go to the next one. All right, so let's, uh, Linda just talked a little bit about 1970. Let's talk a little bit about that, that era. She gave kind of the, the upside, I'm gonna give the downside. So this is a map from uh, 1969. It's from a report that the uh, predecessor organization to Greenbelt Alliance, People for Open Space, did. And I don't think you probably can't read the legend very well, but all the area in white up there on the map was area that uh, certain regional leaders considered to be open space available for urban expansion. So really at this time, while we were really at a, a transition, this movement to protect open space was really getting going, um, but at the same time there was a, a, an existing and prevailing philosophy that development should happen through sprawl development. And I just want to take a quick look at what some of the consequences of that could have been. So let's go to the next slide. So this is the Marin Headlands, and uh, it was considered for development of a new town called Marincello. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> Napa Valley, there were ideas to turn it into the San Jose of the North. Yeah. Go to the next one. San Pablo Reservoir, there were proposals to develop uh, on the hillsides right around San Pablo Reservoir. Obviously, none of these things happened. Um, uh, and that's because of activism from organizations like Greenbelt Alliance, a lot of other organizations around the region. It was because of work of, of land trusts and open space districts, groups like the East Bay Regional Park District and others, Mid Peninsula that were just, uh, just mentioned. Um, and, uh, and I think leadership from a few uh, really smart, uh, really committed uh, regional leaders. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so uh, continuing to look a little bit at the success and the progress we've made. So this is from uh, a study that we started to do, a uh, series of studies actually, that we at Greenbelt Alliance started to do back in 1989 um, called At Risk. And the idea was to let's look at the threats to the Bay Area's Greenbelt, the threats from development over about a 30 year time period, uh, what the threats going out for 30 years would be. And when you look at this in, um, uh, uh, when you look at this over time, there's actually some pretty good news. So this is from the first map again, 1989, 781,000 acres were at risk of development at that point in time. To put that in context, that's uh, the, uh, uh, an area 24 times the size of the city of San Francisco. So let's go to the next one. This is from the next study that was done in 1994, I believe. Yeah, 1994. Um, uh, and there were 570,000 acres at risk. So next one, 2000, it was down to 490. Next one. Uh, in uh, 2006, we were down to 401,000 acres at risk. Next one, 322,000 acres at risk in the last assessment that we did um, in uh, 2000, 2012. So obviously the trend so far has been in the right direction, but there's still challenges here. Um, and after all, 322,000 acres is uh, about the size of 10 San Francisco's. So, so we're, not, we're not done yet. Um, next slide. So we need to be really vigilant. We need to be vigilant about places like Coyote Valley, uh, south of San Jose. This is a major wildlife corridor, also has great agricultural protection. 
uh, potential. Uh, next, uh, next slide. So we also need to be vigilant about places like Tassajara Valley uh, in Contra Costa County. Um, it's a place where just last year a proposal to build 170 estate homes was beaten back. Um, there's now another proposal by the same developers for something smaller, so we have to keep watching that, so stay tuned out there. And there are, and I was talking to some people ahead of, uh, ahead of getting up here, more and more proposals for development of open space that keep coming up now that the economy is heating back up. So let's go to the next slide. So, and actually click one more on that one. So uh, because we have a strong economy, because it's desirable to live here, and we also have this fact that people keep having babies, um, we, are, we have a growing population in the Bay Area, going from about 7 million people to 9 million over the, next, uh, uh, over the next generation. So I think the real challenge, let's go to the next slide. The real challenge is uh, what do we do to enhance and maintain the protections of our open spaces in the face of this growing population? And just uh, click two or three times here. So I think this gets, to, um, this gets to what Wendy was saying earlier. It's we need a suite of different things. There is no one silver bullet. And I would offer, and I'll talk very briefly here at kind of a high level, about three different approaches that I firmly believe in. We need to do good planning, we need good policies, and we need, uh, and we need funding. Um, so next slide, and then actually go to the next one. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit, uh, well first of all, just I wanna quickly say, we need planning, good plans. These are the maps for where we should go in the future, and we need it at every level, from the regional level down to the very local level. But I'm gonna talk briefly about the, the regional level and about this thing called Plan Bay Area that was passed by ABAG and MTC uh, just, uh, just last summer. And I think, and I know there's actually some controversy here, but I'm gonna put out there that actually this is a very good plan, a very good direction in terms of open space conservation. And here's why, let's go to the next one. Again, back in 1970, the prevailing wisdom about how we should grow was a small vision. Take all that white and uh, think about turning it into cities. Go to the next map here. This is the priority conservation area, or not priority conservation areas, the priority development areas that have been put in place through Plan Bay Area. Um, growth within existing urban boundaries, uh, a focus on growing in these priority development areas around uh, transit service, really moving the philosophy of, gr of growth in this region from a sprawl first philosophy to an infill development first philosophy. That's a, that's a big step in the right direction. You know, Plan Bay Area is not perfect. Uh, right now, for example, we and some of our allied organizations are working to uh, help ABAG update the priority conservation areas so that as Plan Bay Area gets implemented, those turn into really a good foundation for uh, how we uh, pursue our conservation strategies both at the regional and the local level. Um, but again, I think Plan Bay Area is a, is a step in the right direction. So let's, next slide, let's talk about policy. Um, and let's uh, go over here. So this is what I was saying in the answer to the, the question that was put out there. Um, very critically, uh, cities and counties protect about two million acres of the three million acre green belt um, through policy. However, Policy is ephemeral. Um, policy uh, often have sunset dates. It can be changed on a Tuesday night by three votes of a city council. So we have to be, uh, uh, we have to watchdog, we have to update, we have to improve uh, policies that are on the books. Let's go to the next one. So um, urban limit lines or urban growth boundaries is mentioned. Uh, at the municipal level, the city level, we have 37 voter approved urban growth boundaries across, uh, across the San Francisco Bay Area. You can actually see, this is one place where you can see policy play out on, a, on the ground. There's the urban growth boundary out in, uh, in Contra Costa County, um, clearly delineating where growth goes and does not go. But again, many of these are going to expire. They're usually set up to last for about 20 years. Some of these are going to expire in the next few years and we have to, uh, we have to readopt those. Next slide. Um, my contention is that we need to improve our policies to protect agricultural land. We have a lot of good policy in place that just protects the land, but I think we need to work on tweaking those policies to um, uh, ensure that uh, local agriculture can be successful on the land. And so that's a policy innovation approach. Let's go to the next one. And uh, another thing I would say is that if we are really committed to protecting open space, from a policy environment, we need to work on making sure that policies around development within our cities and towns help turn places that look like this, next slide, into places that look like this. We're really creating neighborhoods that are accessible to and meet the needs of people across the income spectrum. I'm now gonna make a shameless plug. Go to the next slide. 
This is our newest report. Um, so it is a report about what are some of those uh, policy tools that can be used at the city level to make infill development happen. If you want to check it out, go to uh, greenbelt.org. So next slide here. So and then lastly, and you know, Wendy really hit on this, uh, is, the, is the funding piece. Um, go to the next slide. Unfortunately, right now, that pile of money, the giant pile of money that's available for open space conservation is not getting bigger. In fact, in many ways, it's getting smaller right now. Prop 84 passed back in 2006, a statewide bond measure that's one of the uh, best sources right now for open space conservation. That is dwindling. So we need money for lots of different things. We need money from, for everything from protecting more open space to, uh, uh, to stewarding the landscape that we have. We need money to uh, invest in the businesses that support local agriculture so again, farmers can thrive and stay on their land. We need money for all of that and we need money from all sorts of different kinds of sources. Again, getting back a little bit to what Wendy was saying. We need public dollars, we need private dollars, we need funding for open space to be really a, a more integral part of the uh, process for implementing Plan Bay Area. We need those ballot measures that were spoken of earlier, we need to get those uh, approved. And so make another shameless plug here. I want everybody to go to yesonopenspace.org. That's the, uh, uh, the website for uh, the measure to raise funds for the Mid-Peninsula Regional uh, Open Space District. Um, that one is going to be on the ballot in June. If that gets passed and it gets passed well, um, by, you know, by a large margin, that will set the tone for future open space funding measures that are coming down the pike. So everybody needs to go to that and everybody needs to support that. Everybody needs to contribute to that, whether frankly you live in uh, San Mateo County or not. Um, so uh, this is actually the last piece here. Um, so the one other thing that we really need is we need political will. So this is Roseanne Nieto from out in Concord. And we worked with her very um, closely as the Concord Naval Weapons Station reuse plan was being uh, was being coming up was was being developed. So let's go to the next slide here, really quick. So that plan originally, when the city was thinking about it, um, was to sprawl out over this entire area, about 5,000 acres east of Concord, um, everything that's really in, in color up there. Um, but ultimately, everything that's in green. Uh, is going to be protected as open space, including the light green, which is uh, going to go to East Bay Regional Park District. And that was all because of activism from people like Roseanne. So if we want to be successful in our goals around open space conservation in the region, in essence, we really need a lot of people like Roseanne. So I'm going to wrap up here, uh, just simply say we are at a really critical time. Um, the legacy of conservation in this region is going to, um, it's going to change. It's either going to get better or it's going to uh, get worse depending on what we do. And, uh, uh, and I really encourage us to take this step in the right direction. So thanks much and uh, uh, welcome the next speaker up here. Thank you, Jeremy. And now we'll hear from Sam Shuckert, who is the Executive Director of the California State Coastal Conservancy. Thank you very much. Good morning. Okay, I'll start my own personal timer right now. <coughs> so uh, I'm the head of the State Coastal Conservancy, and my task is to give you some idea of how all the various pieces work together uh, to uh, protect land and, and open space here in the in the Bay Area. Uh, and undoubtedly, some of you at least have actually flown over the Bay Area. Uh, and, you know, you don't need all these maps to see how well we've done because you see these very dense urban areas with, with green spaces, you know, right, right smack next to them. And I'm lucky enough to live in a neighborhood in Oakland where I can hop on my bike and be in a park in about, in about 20 minutes. Um, it's not an accident, as you've heard, that, that this happened. My own agency, the Coastal Conservancy, has been involved in, in land conservation uh, since we began 36 years ago. In the nine county Bay Area, we have uh, worked with dozens of partners, many of whom are here today, uh, and have accomplished about 175 acquisitions, protecting 135,000 acres permanently. And that's to continue the metaphor, that's about one and a half San Francisco's, 135,000 acres. Um, and I, I want to say at the outset that when I talk about acquisition, uh, buying the land and bringing it into public ownership, of course, is not the only way, it's not the only tool that we have, it's not the only way to, to, to keep open space open. 
so I'm going to use the term acquisition kind of, uh, kind of gen generically. And as you already heard, a typical acquisition involves uh, many, many partners uh, because uh, when you're doing, when you're buying land near growing cities, uh, it tends to be very expensive uh, and often very complicated in a, in, a, in a legal sense. The actual things that have to happen uh, for land to be acquired include negotiations with landowners, contracting for an appraisal, setting up escrow, taking title, figuring out who's going to own the land long term, how it's going to be monitored, how it's going to, how it's going to be managed. Uh, some projects are far more complicated than others, and it's not unusual for whoever requires the land first to wind up giving it or selling it to somebody else uh, down the road. Uh, we were really blessed here in the Bay Area because we have a very robust community of federal st agencies, state agencies, uh, local entities like the, the park and open space districts, as well as nonprofit land trusts. Uh, and because we have that, that, that richness, that uh, biodiversity, if you will, we've been able to, we've been able to accomplish a great deal. So let me, let me give you some examples that, that illustrate this. Uh, in 2009, uh, we were involved in and ultimately accomplished the, uh, the, the uh, purchase of the 5,600-acre Jenner Headlands property on the Sonoma Coast, just, uh, just south of uh, the Mendocino line. Uh, it had been slated for uh, a mix of vineyard development and uh, what we in the business call McMansions. Um, very large piece of, of land. Uh, what it took to get that done were contributions from, I'm going to count on my fingers here, the Forest Service, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Coastal Conservancy, the Wildlife Conservation Board, Sonoma County Ag and Open Space District, the Betty and Gordon Moore Foundation, uh, the uh, Sonoma Land Trust, and the Wildlands Conservancy. So. That's eight, <laughs> right? It, it took eight different entities uh, to pull it off. Um, this was one of these cases where the acquisition happened uh, initially by one nonprofit and then and then went to another nonprofit, and they're now in the uh, in the in the uh, business of figuring out how to provide access there. And actually, the Coastal Conservancy is helping them with some funding to figure that out. Uh, and that's a pretty typical uh, kind of story. We've been working with the Peninsula Open Space Trust uh, since the 1980s. Uh, we've participated in 19 acquisitions that have pr protected 16,000 acres in San Mateo and Santa Clara County. Um, for some of those properties, Post has become the long-term long -term owner. Uh, in other cases, Post has acquired them and then passed them on to the Mid-Peninsula Open Space District. Um, having uh, a, a very competent land trust in a relatively small uh, area uh, is really advantageous. The, the land trusts often can move faster on opportunities than a government agency can because you know we're just not as quick as, uh, as the private sector. Uh, and also, uh, frankly, you know, if I go to visit uh, a farmer or a rancher who's thinking of selling his land and I say, uh, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, it doesn't always work very well. <laughs> so that's something else that the, that the private nonprofits uh, can do. A great deal of western Marin County is, remains open ranch land thanks to the Marin Agricultural Land Trust. Malt was established uh, by farmers and conservationists in 1980, actually with the grant from the Coastal Conservancy. They have a very narrow focus, which is to keep West Marin uh, in ranch land uh, and to make sure that there's enough ranches out there that they don't lose the infrastructure that supports that, that, supports that uh, business. Malt has permanently protected more than 46,000 acres uh, in Marin, with funding from a wide variety of agencies, including uh, including my own, uh, we've I think we've given them about ten million dollars now since they were since they were founded. And if you drive around, or as I do, bike around West Marin, you'll see these signs. This land is permanently protected by malt, and it might have my logo on it, or it might have somebody else's logo on it. So it's a real success story. 
Uh, in the East Bay, uh, we've done 26 acquisitions with the East Bay Regional Park District, which, by the way, was founded in the depths of the Depression in the 1930s, uh, when you know money was even tighter than you know than than, than it is now. Um, and we've protected about 7,000 acres with them, uh, and they typically uh, manage. Uh, the land that they wind up uh, owning. And one of the things that they bring to the table is uh, uh, a very robust uh, planning uh, and technical assistance uh, capability that helps uh, other uh, land trusts and other, and other local uh, governments that are within their, their sphere of interest. Um, a common denominator for all of this, of course, is, is money. And uh, many parts of the Bay Area have benefited from uh, having a lot of conservation aware local residents who have been willing to open up their wallets for local entities. Uh, you heard about the fact that MidPen is going to the ballot in June. Uh, hopefully the Santa Clara County uh, Open Space District, whose chief is here, will be going to the ballot later. Uh, we hope you, you you vote for both of those if you know if if you can, and in fact, if you look at the Coastal Conservancy's funding pattern in the nine county Bay Area, uh, we've been able to do more in the places that have robust, well-funded park and open space districts because there's somebody to take ownership of the land and to and to manage the land and to contribute some some local money. Um, I wanted to end uh, my piece of this by talking about what is uh, both our largest and our most often overlooked bit of open space, which would be San Francisco Bay itself. And just like some of the slides that Jeremy sh showed, San Francisco Bay was slated to be completely filled in uh, back in the 50s by our friends at the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, that didn't happen because a group of citizens got together to to uh, make sure it didn't happen and created the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Uh, right now, I have the pleasure to be the chair of a new uh, regional government entity, the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority. Uh, we are seriously considering going to the ballot in November with a, a, a pretty small uh, parcel tax. The money would be used for restoration of San Francisco Bay, flood control, uh, and access to the bay. And the bay, uh, the bay shoreline and the bay itself are, uh, you know, well, they're what make the San Francisco Bay Area the Bay Area. They're also incredible recreational resources. I mean, while we're sitting here in this almost windowless conference room, hundreds if not thousands of people are biking and walking and rollerblading on the bay trail and windsurfing in the bay and doing all those things. <laughs> I'm right here with you. <laughs> what can I say? I mean, I rode my bike here, but, but that's, that's about it for the day. So um, we're, we, we view what we are proposing to do with the Bay, a continuation of the legacy that we've talked about this morning in terms of uh, Bay Area residents uh, really loving the place that they live in and being willing to uh, contribute to its conservation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. And then our final speaker is Beverly Lane. And I, I really am very proud to mention that Beverly is a lifelong league member. And she actually served on the state league board in the 1970s. So we're very delighted to have uh, both a league member and an elected official of longstanding be one of our presenters. Uh, Beverly, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Linda. I was thinking about it today, and I think I have been a league member for almost 50 years. So um, I'm looking around here, and you know, your vocabulary is really familiar to me. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to be part of this panel, um, speaking on behalf of the East Bay Regional Park District. And I do want to um, introduce my fellow um, director from the regional parks, who is here, John Sutter. Uh, John, <laughs> hearing both from uh, Jeremy and Sam, you know, uh, John was one of the founders of the People for Open Space and is on the Restoration Authority. So he continues to have an interest in, in the environment, which, which is uh, really impressive. 
Well, uh, to talk about the Regional Park District, indeed we are really a excellent example of progress in preserving open space over, yay, these many years. Uh, in 1934, um, voters in the East, East Bay, really this side of the hills, uh, decided to create the East Bay Regional Park District by over 70%. And often when we have had um, measures on the ballot, that has been um, the percentage that uh, we have received. So we are very fortunate to have a population in the East Bay that values their open space and appreciates the East Bay Regional Park District. We are uh, one of the first, or we were the first and the largest regional park uh, district in the country. And, um, the first three parks that we provided here were ones that are very familiar to you, Tilden, Temescal, and Sibley. And uh, I wish I were out there enjoying one of those right now. <laughs> um, but what we offer in the East Bay now is um, a park district that covers all of Alameda and Contra Costa County. It includes open space, lands, lakes, shorelines, trails, uh, Camp Arroyo Environmental Education Center, and all of this is close to home. We uh, have now, from those first three parks, grown to 65 parks, 114,000 acres, and we have optioned uh, over 3,000 more acres as I speak. When we talk about trails linking different parts of the um, Bay Area and the East Bay, you know, we work on the Bayshore Trail, the Bay Ridge Trail, the Great Delta Trail, and the Calaveras Ridge Trail in the um, inner valleys. And we have trails that go from one park to another. In addition, uh, we have the multi-use paved trails which provide a commute alternative and help to decongest our highways to a certain extent. In addition, since we are looking at a pretty devastating drought, I do want to mention that over 70,000 of our acres are grazed, and they are part of a, a continuation of ranching agriculture and these ranchers are, you know, when it's inconvenient for us to look at our water supply, you can only imagine what they are confronting with this uh, drought of last year and dry years before that. So um, keep that in mind when you think uh, about the open space because one of the ways we uh, control our vegetation, prevent fires, and also promote habitat is with those ranch lands that we learn to uh, hike on along with some of the cattle. So how does all this progress happen? It happens with support from the public, help from our elected officials, and we're a little bit in mourning to see Congressman George Miller retire, um, and many, many partners, and both uh, Sam and Jeremy have mentioned them, land trusts, um, the Coastal Conservancy has been a, a wonderful partner, the Moore Foundation and Family Foundations, Wildlife Conservation Board. Uh, we've gotten money from state park bonds and from the federal government through m many different uh, sources. And um, our partners include the Greenbelt Alliance. I mean, all of those projects that Jeremy talks about that are within Contra Costa County uh, have been a combination of local activists, the Greenbelt Alliance, some of the land trusts, and the park district. And uh, we can be a very potent force as we work together. Someone asked about urban limit lines or urban, urban growth uh, boundaries. Those two are very important for us because when, um, particularly when people are deciding whether they are, what they are gonna do with their land, and I think of some of these ranch families that have been there for 80 and 100 years and they are trying to decide what to do. Because there's an urban growth boundary, um, it has a, a significant effect on the, their decisions as to whether they might uh, sell land to us. 
So what of the future? Um, Jeremy said that there may have been a little controversy over the Plan B area, and you saw there was quite a bit of, um, there were some very rowdy meetings. As I went to a few of those. Um, but from the vantage point of the open space agencies, um, we really could have expected that what would come out of the, the plan was a real partnership. And they t constantly talked about um, the environment, um, the economy, and equity. And I have to say that while there are some really good aspects to it, these, these uh, areas that are, are reflected as different now in terms of planning for development, uh, they really didn't do the kind of support that the open a space agencies would have preferred. Um, there was discretionary money of over $50 billion in this plan. Um, and the final result was a $10 million grant program, which was supplemented by the Coastal Conservancy. Thank you, Sam. Um, but when you look at, at it at a, in, a, in conclusion, you really have to say that the Plan Bay area um, really had no vision for the open space. And to my mind, that reflects the fact that they didn't really value it. And um, each of us who are involved with open space agencies that do need those funds to uh, expand our open space if the population is going to expand, um, did not get from this plan what, what was needed. In the Park District, if you figure that we are going to grow in the East Bay by 30 percent uh, and keep the same proportion of open space regional park lands to the population, that would mean that we would need to grow by about 35,000 acres. And that should have been really seen in the uh, Plan Bay area. Um, but we've had wonderful progress. I mean, I can't say that we haven't. Uh, we've had it in every way. And um, in recent years, um, we've constructed a new Deer Valley Regional Park in the East Bay, which included and includes the, the Roddy Ranch and um, Smith properties of almost 1,000 acres. And so I like to add up acreage from like Black Diamond through Deer Valley and include the Marsh Creek State Park and Los, and um, uh, the reservoir and Round Valley. And we're well over 35,000 acres in a wildlife corridor that extends there in the East County. It's very exciting. In Pleasanton Ridge, uh, we added the Robertson property, which made that park the um, second largest of our parks in the regional uh, park district. And in the future, we are looking at the Concord Hills Regional Park out of, Naval, out of the uh, Weapon Station. We're looking at a regional park in Alameda out of uh, that uh, base closure, a Dumbarton Quarry Regional Park, better delta access, and shoreline trails through uh, North Richmond. We are also looking at a gateway park at the foot of the Bay Bridge. Now, this is not exactly an 8,000-acre park, but it will be a, a park that's a significant landmark coming into the East Bay. Certainly, John and I are hoping for that. We do have a number of challenges, though. You know, there are challenges every time you, it's sometimes it's easier to get a park than to get public access. Uh, we need to uh, address our operations funding. We need to get young people away from their electronic experiences and outside. And uh, we need to reach our new populations. I don't know if you realize, but uh, we have a, a significant Korean uh, population here in the um, East Bay, and they all have a tradition of uh, hiking in those hills in Korea, and they are hiking in our hills. So, you know, we look forward to all of these new projects and to meeting these challenges and uh, working with our wonderful partners, uh, working on a, uh, East Bay parks, which are really a shining bay to shining bay. Thank you. 
Thank you, panel. And now we have questions from the audience. Okay, first question for Jeremy Madsen. How much of the open space protected by the Greenbelt Alliance preserves, quote, wild places for continuity of habitat for various species, such as coyotes and wolves, flyaways for bird migration? What can you tell us about uh, the open space that you show is protected? So um, I'll answer that a couple of different ways. Uh, first, in terms of exact number, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, but actually I can get that to you, and I guess that gets to my second point. One of the things that has happened, and uh, Jen Fox from the Bay Area Open Space Council is here, and she might uh, talk a little bit about this later. The, um, the data that we have today about the importance of, uh, of our, our natural and our working landscapes is, is incredible. Um, you know, we've done a, a, an excellent job, not just we, but uh, the, the conservation community has done an excellent job of really getting a chance to understand um, what makes these lands critical from a habitat perspective, from say a watershed perspective, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, prime soils for agriculture. You know, for example, I'll give just a couple of anecdotal examples, two of the slides I showed. Coyote Valley and Tassajara Valley are known as uh, critical wildlife corridors. Coyote Valley is one of the best ways to get, uh, uh, you know, the, the species get from uh, the Hamilton Range to, uh, to the, uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains down to the coast. Um, and so, uh, so we now have that information and can inject that into planning in the future and, and use that information to, to make the case. So if, if whoever you know, wants to know the, ask the question, wants to know exact acreage, uh, give me uh, an email address afterwards. I can um, uh, get that out of uh, uh, our staff back at Greenbelt Alliance. Um, but it's, uh, you know, that information is all kind of at our fingertips now. Thank you. Next question for Sam. You mentioned a possible bond on the November ballot to preserve, restore the San Francisco Bay. Aren't there other organizations already doing that, especially in the South Bay salt ponds? How will your bond complement the other work? Sam. Sounds like a planted question to me. Um, so uh, what we have had for the work of restoring the bay uh, is a mix of state and federal and some private money. Uh, and my organization has been the primary state uh, state funder and, and you know, in, in fact, we're sort of driving the, driving the train in the South Bay. Uh, those sources of funds, particularly uh, federal and state, are now uh, dwindling. And what we don't have is a source of local money uh, other than what private uh, funders are willing to do from from time to time so the the notion is that uh, it will give us a more robust portfolio of funding sources if we have a local funding source and it will complement what whatever the state and whatever the feds can do uh, and both uh, uh, federal and state governments in my organization is is uh, is no exception of course like to see matching local money in, in, proje in projects. So, uh, you know, we think it's important to have a, uh, a local source of money that is uh, steady, that you can count on year to year, because of course the federal budget, uh, it's, it's been a wild ride with the federal budget the last few years, let's just say that. And, and until recently, uh, it's, it's been a pretty wild ride with the state budget as well. So. Uh, a source of money that you can count on every year that comes from locals, uh, I think will have a big positive impact in our efforts to, to restore the bay and provide access to it. Thank you. Next question for Beverly. What is the Delta Trail and where does it go? And push the red button on the, there. Right. The, um, I thought you were going to ask about the Calaveras Ridge Trail, but uh, the, what's called a Great Delta Trail is one that would really be a continuation of the Bay Shore Trail, um, beginning in Martinez and going around the uh, northern shoreline of Contra Costa County and then extending into the Delta. So um, there's quite a bit of marshlands there, and and um, 
one of the challenges that we have in these all of these short trails is not damaging um, the water resource, but uh, allowing people to use um, use areas as trails. So. Um, Boardwalks are planned for, for Bruner Marsh, for one thing, and we may be looking at some kind of improvements like that in the, in the Great Delta Trail as well. But um, if you haven't been out there, this, the, um, the beauties of seeing that the Carquinas uh, Strait and the uh, San Pablo Bay as you go further in, and then of course the Delta are, are really an insp inspirational part of our Bay Area. Thank could you. I, could I add yeah, to go that? ahead. So uh, most of you probably don't know, and I didn't know until about four years ago, but the state of California has a master plan for long-distance trails, uh, the Coastal Trail, the Bay Trail, the Bay Ridge Trail, the, the Delta Trail. Uh, and there is, at least on paper, plan for a Sierra to the Sea Trail that would allow you to walk uh, essentially down the American River watershed from the Sierras through the Delta on the Delta Trail, hook up to the, to the Bay Trail and, and, and to the Coastal Trail. Thank you. Uh, I guess this, we'll try this on Jeremy. Uh, does the Williamson Act still have any beneficial effect on our open space? Uh, so the uh, you know the short answer is is yes, and so uh, Williamson Act essentially for those of you who don't know gives uh, a degree of tax relief for uh, farmers and ranchers who, uh, who 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 wish to stay on their land. Um, the um, uh, uh, the the as I mentioned in uh, my remarks, the great challenges for especially for farmers and ranchers in the Bay Area uh, where there's urban edge pressure. To, uh, to, to stay on the land. Um, and so basically any tools that we can give them um, are, are greatly beneficial. Uh, there have uh, been challenges in having the Williamson Act continue to be funded. And so that's one of the things that uh, needs to continue to be worked on going, going forward in, in state budget. Yeah, yes, as, as just a little background is that the Williamson Act agreements that property owners have remain in effect. The problem is that the counties and cities that they're in are no longer being reimbursed by the state government. And so there's an incentive for the public agencies to begin cancellation of these contracts, and uh, that's the problem is they're not being funded. It used to be a reimbursable mandate that state would reimburse the counties or cities for the loss of property tax. So that it's a funding issue actually in the state budget. Hey. But so far, people who have the agreements uh, are holding on as long as they can. Right, it's not only a cancellation issue, it's, not, it's an issue of, of new agreements. Yeah. yeah, there obviously is no incentive right. for new new agreements at this point or very little. So uh, it, it's, it's an agreement between the property owner and the public agency to keep their property tax low. And so the agency is reluctant. Right. Exactly. right at this point. Okay, here's a question for all three. What are your organizations doing to bring awareness of the issues, of these issues, to younger age population so that there is continued support through the years? Uh, Beverly? Well, you know, we're a regional uh, uh, park district and so we like to have people come into our parks and uh, that issue of getting the younger generation in is truly a challenge um, so we're we're doing a variety of things and one of them is um, having some uh, a, a new program set up for third grades throughout the um, East Bay, which uh, provides a curriculum with the state standards and uh, helps to address and encourage um, third graders to do the uh, uh, 10 things each child should have a chance to do in nature. And um, so that's something that we had a pilot program last year and we're hoping to expand it. Then of course there's the kids trail challenge in which we are trying to uh, have them go out and fill out a little passport book and, and do that. And then any of our environmental education programs at the visitor centers with our naturalists, 
um, at Camp Arroyo, we again try to have that experience for them. And we do have a um, Parks Express uh, program, which people are invited to uh, contribute to, which brings whole classes uh, into a regional park and introduces them to, to um, the outside. But you know, they need to have more than one experience because that first experience sometime, um, they just have to get over being uneasy about trees. <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, we have had a, a, a very sad stories of, of children out of the inner cities who come and they'll, uh, they'll get into a park and they will worry that there are bears that are going to uh, attack them and they are not familiar with um, any facets of the environment. They've, they've grown up in an asphalt situation and um, so there is so much to be done there. Right, Jeremy? I just, uh, Beverly's last uh, comment there in terms of getting multiple experiences just reminded me of a, a friend who works at, um, works at a very significant conservation organization, which will go nameless right now, who uh, came to a meeting once and she had this look on her face, just, you know, she seemed, you know, really down. And it was like a Monday and it's like, you know, what's wrong? And well, you know, it's like we went out on, over the weekend and took my like three-year-old daughter out into the park and, and she, she's afraid of dirt. Um, <laughs> And so that was like two or three years ago. And over time, that has improved. And now she's happy to go out and get dirty. So I think that, that idea is, is really important. I would say just in terms of Greenbelt Alliance, um, two, two things. Uh, first is we do have an outings program, which I would encourage people to go and check out. We tailor some of those specifically for families. Like last year, we did a, a Father's Day outing um, so that people can really get out and go on guided tours into the Green Belt and, uh, and you know, really fall in love with, uh, with the place. The, the second, and this is a bit of a, a, a departure, but I think, and it gets a little bit back to the conversation about Plan Bay Area, is we in the conservation community need to do a much better job of creating the linkages between what uh, different constituencies, including young people, but not just young people, care about and what we're all about. And I think one of the things that happened in the whole Plan Bay Area experience is that uh, you know, for example, some of the, it was run by a regional transportation authority. The people who cared about transportation said, we need a lot of money. We don't even have this $50 billion of discretionary money. is isn't even enough to take care of our transportation needs. We love open space, but we can't go and be giving it to something you know beyond what we care about. Yeah, there we go. But it's it's nonetheless that's how they feel, <laughs> and and so that idea of kind of and Wendy was talking about it, making those linkages between our issues and 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 this constituency and other constituencies is a real critical next step if we are to preserve and enhance the the conservation legacy of the region. Thank you, Sam. So the. Coastal Conservancy has done a number of things. We've historically uh, provided a great deal of funding to the various uh, nature centers, uh, aquaria, and maritime museums that are located within our jurisdiction. And all of them have pretty robust uh, school kid programs. In fact, we had a board meeting at one in Orange County a couple of months ago, and, and the kids were just, you know, busload after busload of kids, many of whom had never, you know, seen the ocean before, were arriving to spend a day uh, climbing around on the, on the tall ships. Uh, we just concluded uh, a grant round called Explore the Coast, which were uh, small grants uh, aimed at uh, people and organizations who want to bring young people uh, out, uh, out, out to the coast. Um, all of this, of course, is, is dependent on how much funding we have at any particular time. Uh, the, the biggest obstacle for school groups, well, the two biggest ob obstacles for school groups are the cost of transportation, because it costs money to get them out there on a bus, and the length of the school day. Uh, because if, you know, if your school day is from 9 to 3 or 8.30 to 3, uh, and your, your outdoor thing is happening under the auspices of your, you know, science class, we may only have an hour and a half, right? And, and, and they have to be back by, 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 by three o'clock. So those are, those are some barriers. And, and I, I also want to add, there is a significant block of 
uh, urban legislators in uh, in the state assembly and in the state senate who simply don't believe that um, their constituents uh, make use of uh, some of the places that we have uh, that we've talked about today and and. You know, tagging on to Jeremy's comments, that's a that's a political problem that we need to uh, we need to work on. Okay, there's one question here. Well, let me let oh, me add ahead. one one other right, thing, um, and and that is, um, you know, we have our regional and nature uh, tabloid out there, uh, out here on the table. It comes out every other month, and that's an a, a reminder for anybody who gets a newspaper or looks at them in in the um, library of the opportunities to just get out there. And then the other thing I have to mention is that um, we do have two mobile, um, um, they're not both visitor center, but one's a mobile visitor center which does go into the um, schools and stays there all day and provides all kinds of introductory information for uh, children and the other is our mobile fish exhibit, which is quite a large uh, aquarium, which uh, introduces uh, whoever sees it to the variety of, of uh, freshwater fish that we have around or once um, had around. So we're trying to move out and do that. When you see the Bob Walker pictures today for lunch, uh, you need to know that one of the things that Bob Walker did was he took people on um, excursions into open space and then he gave everyone a postcard and they s could send those postcards off to, well in that case it was the regional parks, but um, that's the possibility if we could send, get people to send postcards to their legislators that we are enjoying it and need more. Um, they like to hear from people where they don't get 500,000 one day, but they get an ongoing flow of uh, reactions from people. So think about postcards. Thank you. We have a couple questions on Plan Bay Area. One of them has to, to do with can it be amended to strengthen support for open space? I can answer that. It basically, the Plan Bay Area goes in, in a cycle. So it has been adopted and it will begin almost immediately the, fa the next phase, which I believe is about three or four years. Uh, but right now, uh, it, is, it is what it is for the moment. Uh, the question here then, in addition, is what, if anything, is your organization doing to work with counties and cities on the implementation of Plan Bay Area? Uh, Jeremy? What? Yeah, and let me, let me say a couple words about, I guess, both of those. So, you know, the first is exactly right, Linda, that it's uh, going to be updated again in 2017. That's the next step of bite of the apple. Um, there also is, and I alluded to it, this uh, process of updating the, the priority conservation areas um, that is something that ABAG is doing, not part of Plan Bay Area, but it's related to Plan Bay Area. Um, and again, getting those as a, a good foundation um, for uh, uh, ongoing regional conservation, regional local conservation strategies, I think is really critical. So I'd encourage folks to engage in that. In a lot of ways, a lot of what Greenbelt Alliance is doing over the next you know, few years is about uh, Plan Bay Area implementation. Plan Bay Area does not require local governments to do anything in terms of land use. Um, it, uh, it, it incentivizes a bit through money. So there's a lot of work with local level planning, with uh, policy change within cities to, again, encourage the right kind of development in the right places, uh, getting good projects approved, um, and various other strategies to make it happen. So uh, you know, really, that is, that is our focus. And we really do want to also, again, along these lines of for the 2017 update, let's build those relationships with the regional agency staff and regional agency leaders who, um, uh, who control this process and make um, uh, you know conservation more of a, a priority going forward, so we really get it uh, you know kind of fully integrated as a as a core element of regional sustainability. Yes, Stan. So the Coastal Conservancy actually was pretty involved on a staff level in pushing for a con the the conservation element that wound up in the plan. However, you know flawed it, it may be, and we will we will continue to do that. Um, it's going to be really important when the next round of planning happens that people who care about open space show up. 
uh, because at the meeting that uh, my Bay Area manager attended, it was m largely uh, uh, Tea Party types uh, yelling about Agenda 21 and black helicopters and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, there'll be another opportunity for citizen uh, engagement, and it's going to be important to, for all of you to engage. Yes. And Beverly, any comment? on? No. Okay, fine. Here's a question that may be back to Sam. I'm not sure about the rest, but this is, how can we keep the San Francisco Presidio with as much open space as possible while fulfilling the trust's obligation to be self-sufficient? Are you involved with the tr Presidio? Uh, mercifully, we are uninvolved uh, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the land use disputes that happen there. Doing very we're, well. we're also not involved in the the uh, uh, off leash dog issue on uh, oh, GGNRA land. Again, thankfully. Thank you. All right. Uh, next question is: What have you found are some of the most effective strategies to convince local cities and agencies to think outside the box, especially to protect floodplains and protect water quality? strategies to convince local yeah. cities and agencies? I, um, I'm newly involved in a Walnut Creek uh, watershed council, and in Contra Costa County, that's the largest uh, watershed, um, which uh, flows out of Ceremone Valley and into the bay. And this is a um, organization that includes environmentalists and representatives from the different cities, and this is an opportunity to get information out to the um, to the different communities from a different angle, mm -hmm. and so you have to look for the opportunities when they when they emerge. Um, one of the things about uh, Plan Bay Area was that so many of the people who are the decision makers at MTC and ABAG had so many other things on their plate, and of course the meetings were no fun. Uh, and um, they just couldn't see the significance of planning for the environmental part of that um, program compared with all the other things that they were concerned about. So it's definitely a dilemma. Thank you. All right. I think we're down to the last question, so uh, let me ask this of Sam again. It, May it says, is there a Bay Area-wide seven or nine county open space or Bay Protection measure headed for the ballot in 2014? Uh, perhaps you can give us some more details. So there is potentially a nine county uh, measure headed to the ballot in 2014 to fund the restoration of San Francisco Bay, wetland restoration, flood control, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and trails and access to the Bay. Uh, there have been very few regional uh, initiatives. Um, I mean, the last one was Regional Measure 2, which was a transportation measure uh, uh, rammed through, I mean, written by the legislature uh, under the auspices of Senator Parada, who was the pro tem at the time. So there's not much, there's very little precedent for doing something like that on a regional basis. The closest we get are um, a district like the Parks District, which is in two counties, or BART, which is, you know, which is in three counties. So there are, there are multi-county entities, but there aren't any, uh, except for the Restoration Authority now, sort of nine-county uh, entities like that. Thank you.